the chat box so please feel free to ask your questions anytime in the in the chat box and we will uh, of course raise the questions in, in public or even call you to to speak the, the question yourself um, one for thing so the, the day is organized as follow i will try to be as quick as possible with my uh bringing any welcoming introduction and then we're going to have four 15 minutes presentations followed by a lively panel discussion that with um, delegate with discussions from the different partner organizations that are part of the, the Spire Consortium. But of course, uh, we aim at a, at a broad and open discussion as much as into a, a mutual learning and a peer learning um, event. So that said, without any further to do, uh, just want to recap that this event discusses the challenges that are posed to participatory planning practices by the restrictions imposed to contrast the spread of the coronavirus. And so the presentations will illustrate how participatory and co-creation initiatives across Europe have been reframed and rearranged in order to allow collective inclusive actions in compliance to social distancing requirements. And uh, the, uh, let me try and share my, my screen now uh, with the presentation which is here. So the, um, the agenda for today is uh, an introduction presentation by Anatol Itten, who is a postdoc researcher at uh, TU Delft, and he, is, uh, he has a PhD in conflict resolution and is currently postdoc researcher on co-creation and mass participation at the Delft University of Technology. He's also a visiting lecturer in political theory at the University of Stuttgart and the co-founder of Disrupted Society Institute Institute in Amsterdam. And he will uh, set, up, set up the scene for, for this discussion, this, speaking about the participation, co-creation and uh, social distancing from an academic uh, point of view. Then his presentation will be followed by um, a delegate from the, the municipality of Turin, uh, Mr. Alberto Rudelat, who works for the European Funds and Innovation Department of the city of Turin, and is especially involved in, um, in social innovation uh, projects, including the, the UIA project uh, tonight, which is going to be the main focus of his presentation. Uh, Alberto will be followed by uh, Meia Vippo from VAG Amsterdam, who is an expert in teaching and co-creation concept design and creative uh, directions for project at intersection between art, design, society, science, technology, and education. So she is the lead of the co-creation lab of VAG, and she's the responsible for research as well as development and improvement of co-creation and related methods. And last but not least, we have uh, Ileana Toscano from Urbactenna and Callipolis. And Ileana is, a, is an urban specialist and a community engagement expert with a sound experience in developing innovative urban project. She's the founder of Callipolis, which is a nonprofit organization based in Trieste, dealing with sustainable urban development. She's also the lead expert of the urban transfer network, The Playful Paradigm, as well as the co-author of Hints and Tips for Online Facilitation uh, publication by Urbac. And these two, uh, of the, her last works will be the main focus of her presentation. Now, without any further to do, I won't bother you anymore with my um, with my introductions, and I'm very happy to give the floor to to Anatoly. Itten. So, Anatoly, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pietro, for the introduction. Um, yeah, let's start with the mind game. Um, what is this uh, on the wall? Uh, no, seriously, that's uh, just a record of uh, Bruce Springsteen born in the USA. I thought it's uh, handy to uh, keep a little bit in mind what an important night we have in front of us. And uh, the mind game that I want to do with you to kick off uh, this uh, webinar is actually a little bit um, in, um, in terms of co-creation. It's really important that we also have some kind of a mindset when we approach this. And it's uh, often easier said than done. And this mind game should help you a little bit uh, focusing uh, our own on our own role in, in co-creation processes. So uh, first question. So please, I have now three questions. So if you have a little pen and paper, uh, if you have a really good mind, you can also make notes in your mind. But uh, if you have a pen and paper, just write down the answer and later compare it uh, when, when you've done uh, with the whole webinar. How you think about it. So the first question is, I want you to imagine a group that is so completely different from you, that can be in your city or in your country, 
just picture a group that is really, really far from you. Then if you have pictured the group, then the second question I want you to do is now picture a person from this group and think about how that person would describe you in a few terms or words. And when you have uh, written down a few characteristics or what this person would say about you, imagine now, that's the third question. Imagine now how would you like to be described by that person? So why do I do this mind game? I often do that uh, in courses uh, because a lot of people, it's really easy to fall into stereotypes what we think about others. So, but when we have to already imagine what others think about us, um, it becomes a more different task because we all perceive ourselves as very complex people. Whereas we can always really simple say what other people's are and how they are characterized. Uh, at the same time, we also often a bit uh, find it difficult to put somebody in a box, uh, yeah, for in a really quick amount of time. Um, and the third uh, lesson I learn often when I do it so with politicians is that often that they think about people that they're really far away, but then after a while they also think, okay, we maybe could find still common ground on certain issues because the the difference is how how they would describe you uh, how they would describe me and how i would like to be described uh there there they know that there will be bridges uh, that can be uh, built so this is really important that you often also recognize how you think about others and how, what you think they will think about you so next slide um where we now come to uh, co-creation it's also important uh because there are many definitions to uh, pin down a few concepts uh, stemming from literature, we uh, at the Delft University of Technology uh, recently wrote a state-of-the-art report in co-creation. I uh, can share this link uh, later on if you would like to. Uh, and there we uh, went into the different definitions and here are some main concepts that are important to keep in mind. So the pioneering work on this uh, was from Eleanor Ostrom, who won the Nobel Prize in 2009 on the uh, on the problems of the common goods. So uh, like air, environment, animals, uh, because the problems these face are often not solved by one uh, entity, uh, one organization. Uh, and citizen has, have become crucial for enhancing the quality or quantity of the services related to these goods. So um, public health care, um, environmental care, etc. Um, but we have seen that uh, there is also different roles citizens can take. It's not only uh, they can do it as initiators at the early stage, uh, so they come up with own ideas, they bring it to the government or to, uh, to a company. Um, they are co-designers when they sit on the table and drafting uh, together uh, with the municipality or with stakeholders plans for let's say regional de developer, or they can also be co-producers or implementers of public services, where this is not really connected, but uh, they do it simultaneously, but uh, without common agency. Um, uh, what is also an important concept is that uh, citizen professionals really sharing power and responsibility in terms of these goods. So it's not just kind of, there's somebody who said it's not, and somebody who's, um, uh, doing it. So it's really that they, they share power and responsibility. Uh, that's easier said than done. We can, we will discuss it later. Um, and it's often in the early stages of product development, because um, even though there can be also co-producers, like more in the later stage, uh, it's often important that they are uh, early aware of what's happening. 
because then um, co-creation has more space and more uh, room for maneuver. And uh, there's of course also a lot of talk uh, if co-creation is just also possible between more like professional stakeholders and governments and companies. But uh, um, one of the most cited papers about co-creation really says that it's necessary that citizens are present. Um, and we can later look into what kind of citizens that might be. Uh, but see, these are the main concepts that may ground a bit the discussion for today. Okay, next slide. Co-creation is also really a new concept when we look at it uh, about in sustainability transition. So uh, uh, we see that's also uh, just a quick search with it uh, on uh, Scopus database and uh, uh, like that's a database for academic journals. We see really that there's a big rise since 2010. We might still speculate what it is, uh, maybe because of the financial crisis that uh, governments and municipalities have less money to uh, invest, but also more the, the awareness of this concept, uh, a lot of more initiatives, maybe also distrust uh, for big actors. So citizens want to do things autonomously. Uh, so there are still many reasons, but we just see there's more studies about it. We just say it's it's more important uh, concept. And I'm sure because the, 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 the research will continue, I'm sure also the curve will go up again. Um, next slide, please. Um, but today we also talk about re rethinking. So to rethink, we first need to uh, address some critical risks. And we have uh, identified four critical risks. There might be several more, but uh, these four are really crucial in our uh, point of view. So of course, uh, what always remains when you invite citizens or when citizens have a role is a participation gap. Uh, um, there's a bias who people who participate, who are uh, doing co-creation, who, who have own initiatives, uh, citizen collectives. Uh, these are not uh, representative of uh, the whole society. And usually it happens there where people are uh, motivated and who have resources uh, and usually not uh, where people are disadvantaged. Uh, so this is really something to pay uh, attention to, uh, but it's also a, a, yeah, a problem that is already known for a long time. Um, the expectation gap is, of course, also something not really new. When people come together, they come together in different roles. Uh, the professionals, they're from, uh, uh, from, in, from the, stemming from municipalities or companies, and there are citizens who have more like personal reasons to be involved. Uh, there are people with, um, um, but we, um, uh, an important insight is that you, uh, the, these expectations can also uh, converge. Uh, we see that, for example, citizens get more professional once they really have to take over role uh, that uh, or take over responsibilities from uh, that normally would only uh, public officials have. And on the other hand, we see public officials become more uh, civic or more thinking about the citizen points of view when they engage over a longer time uh, with citizens. And they also feel that they're more also have personal like they also have a personal role in it and not only a professional. So this can also converge in, in, in cases. Uh, power gap is always a, a hidden elephant, of course. There's, uh, it's really important to address this and talk about this because if, uh, uh, if citizens are involved, if there are many stakeholders involved and uh, the power shifts, uh, it can also really disempower citizens. It can frustrate citizens because then they think, yeah, uh, it's just uh, the same thing and now it has a new fancy name, but in the end we're just uh, used to, to get acceptance and not really contribute something and it's not really changing. So that's really important, keep that in mind. And the values gap is of course also uh, if you invite different groups to work together, uh, it might not all, always be a, a happy uh, get together, uh, there might also conflicts arise, there might create tension, uh, so this is part of the process. Uh, but it's also good to be aware of uh, different uh, values that uh, are present. Uh, next slide, please. Um, besides the risks, there also uh, might also be limits next to, of course, a lot of benef benefits that we will hear from uh, probably other uh, speakers and cases, but I try to be a bit uh, on, the, uh, on the devil's advocate side today. Um, important is also that we talk about validity. Uh, because, of course, when you uh, have a lot of people together, uh, some, uh, there's a lot of information, there's a lot of uh, 
uh, facts presented and uh, opinions about something, you know, is, is this really a problem? Uh, about when is a health problem a health problem? Uh, you know, that's, there's, there's a lot of disputes going on. And uh, when, when do we agree about, uh, when, we, when, when can everybody agree that a fact is a fact or when opinion is also valid? So that has to be discussed. It's, it's a lot about parameters or joint fact finding. Uh, and the second question is also, what do we do when everyone is biased? Even science is biased. So there also have to be concepts addressed uh, or measures in place. Uh, if everyone is biased and working together, that it's not just uh, like an argument saying, uh, you're biased and you're biased, okay. So if everyone is biased, how do we move on? That's important. Uh, and that comes that also uh, leads to the next question because it probably will lead to either more pragmatism or more um, uh, more rules uh, and procedures. So pragmatism is often, uh, like co-creation is often a very ideological point. Uh, it's a mindset. But in the end, you always when you start processes, we have now an ongoing process with six co-creation hosts in sustainability transitions in different cities around Europe. And of course, they're very enthusiastic. They write a plan. And in the end, uh, they have to um, implement it. And there are problems. There are people who leave. Uh, so in the end, uh, there's also often limited capacity uh, for co-creation and it's really important that it's not a one-off thing uh, because uh, as said also when you invite citizens, when citizens also become a, a big stakeholders or take a big role uh, and, and the municipality doesn't really follow up, uh, it can be really frustrating. So it's really important also to check uh, much the capacities for such processes. Um, yeah, what is good enough? Are there criteria for success or failure? Uh, something really important to have in mind. And uh, there are probably a lot of comp compromise to be made uh, in terms of uh, what can, uh, can what can citizen contribute, what uh, what are the rules and uh, the laws that guide uh, and, and the cultures that guide uh, co-creation. That's probably different in every country, uh, even in every city. So that's also to, uh, something to keep in mind, how far can you actually go and how much does it allow you, which is actually a, a, an important uh, limit also or chance in, in the third point is co-creation. Is it replacing something that is already there? Is it totally new process or is it something that can be augmented, uh, even maybe scaled up, uh, can it be digitalized? So there is some kind of already groundwork and you can just add it on or do you have to bring it totally in, which means more uh, also internal, like in, in municipality or in the city, more internal um, lobbying that this process can even go through. Uh, is it already uh, something that people do a lot or the, the citizens do a lot uh, already in other projects? So that's really important to, to check what capaci capacities and familiarities are in place. And if uh, politicians are also supporting it, uh, even be, even if it would not be, if it's not a, an issue that's of broad public concern, because that's usually when they're a bit more hesitant. Um, next slide, please. Uh, one or two points, points what I want to make in inclusiveness, uh, we are now seeing in 2020 is, uh, I like this slide because it really shows that all generations come together, like having now a critical mass almost the same. Eh? It will shift again in 10 years time. Uh, the new generations are in majority, but now at the moment, everyone is kind of uh, more or less, or at least the three big generations are more or less in a similar amount, how they are, uh, in, in, at least in the Western, Western countries, how, how much they make up of the societies. That means, like if you're now talking also about digital co-creation, uh, there's always um, a part uh, that is hard to reach, that is a part that focuses more on old ways of working, of old ways of uh, uh, working together. And uh, there's a, a lot of, oh, there's two generations that, that generate, the millennials and the generation Z uh, that will make up in the future a large amount that are already really digital natives. Uh, but bringing all these together, I think, is really complex at the moment and uh, yeah, it needs a lot of uh, maybe more pragmatism uh, or a lot of stamina, but we are in this, you cannot probably not make everyone happy, but at the end, it also shows that everybody is a really important uh, uh, junk of uh, uh, yeah, 
uh, the, the mindsets of each generation counts as much in these generations that was maybe not so much before. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I also read, uh, wrote a recent book chapter about digital co-creation. And we really see, just to ref reflect on that a little bit more, that it's uh, uh, like four groups that are quite difficult to satisfy if you, uh, uh, if you engage them online. And of course, the, 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 what is always a problem, the disadvantaged communities, uh, Peter and I also just talked about how it looks in Romania. So there's still a big, a big amount of groups uh, who don't, don't have access to the internet. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is that they're not really uh, aware uh, that, the, that the government would like to co uh, cooperate with them. Uh, they're also maybe really skeptical. Uh, and if, if, if they would you know, overcome already these two barriers, so if you find them, if you give them access to the internet, and they also have to be familiar, they also have to kind of know how to uh, access digital uh, participation tools. Um, so that's already three steps uh, to, to, to overcome, uh, to, to engage disadvantaged communities, which is, of course, what, if you want to have more uh, uh, environmental justice, is really important to, to get these groups and to improve their standing. So our, our short advice is, for example, to see what social networks they have. They might not be uh, digital networks. Uh, and how to find out how you can reach them and uh, how they can be um, uh, yeah, how they can, can get access to co-creation online. And then we have the older generations, they might be really eager to participate, but then it's also, of course, difficult for them to switch uh, from online to offline to online because they have, might have online access, but they are not really eager to participate online because they often find it, find it more important to see somebody face to face, to talk to a politician, uh, to go to the municipality. And when they're online, they're more skeptical. Um, they also have more security re, uh, concerns. And what we also see a lot with older generations, they think that, uh, it, uh, that uh, online participation makes it too simple, which often results in less quality outcomes, which of course is not true, but it's just the perception they have from online participation. Uh, on the other hand, younger generations, uh, you know, they're like low, in, in, low intensity forms of uh, uh, online activism uh, and also young citizens are really big, uh, uh, aware of their online identity. So if there is, for example, a heated discussion, they often don't want to contribute because they, they, could, uh, they, they could concern that they, their like, contribution to a heated discussion <clears throat> will um, influence other online identities that they have. And last but not least, uh, the big majority, <clears throat> they are people who don't really have a strong opinion <clears throat> on, a, on a topic. And it's really important to activate these people because they make uh, out the, the really uh, big uh, amount of society. <clears throat> and uh, they're very calculative if they should participate or not. And uh, <clears throat> for them, for these people, the, the, the threshold to participate must be low. So uh, it must be easy to access, easy to uh, contribute their opinion, <clears throat> not too much time. So for these people, uh, digital co-creation can be really beneficial in, in, uh, instead of going somewhere on a specific time and uh, to hear a lot of um, opinions they're not interested. So uh, for these people, uh, digital co-creation can be a big advantage. <clears throat> Next slide, sorry about my voice, <clears throat> it's just a bit lost. So <clears throat> I want a good example uh, you can check out, it's called Better Reykjavik. Uh, this is a, a co-creation platform of the city of Reykjavik that has sustained already since quite a long time. Uh, it's also, just a, as I mentioned, it is a culture, of course, in uh, Iceland that is already in place for a long time where citizens collaborate quite intensely with the government, but this platform is a uh, in literature also one of the best practices and that really a lot of these projects are implemented are in place and there are many of them stem from the uh, society and uh, it really shows that uh, it can engage a lot of uh, different and diverse set of uh, uh, groups of people and um, yeah there, there are many many uh, other platforms fail in doing so 
and this uh, example is one of the good practices um, to check out. Yeah, uh, and the last but not least, the last slide that is just a, a metaphor I like often to give. Uh, a lot of the policymakers are afraid if you invite a lot of um, uh, citizens to collaborate to contribute to uh, public uh, goods or services. Um, and often I tell them not to be afraid if you really can uh, engage also the, like, the silent middle group that often uh, is not so present. And this is a, a, a social experiment from Reddit. It's one of the biggest social platforms in, in the US to uh, Facebook uh, and uh, Twitter. Um, and what they, uh, the founders of this uh, uh, platform did, they allowed uh, two years ago the community to program the front page of uh, the, the platform and uh, they gave it 24 hour time and they didn't give any criteria. So what they were of course afraid and that there would uh, uh, in the, the next morning would be a lot of uh, Nazi symbols and hate uh, symbols and uh, vulgar quotes, etc. Uh, and they turn also up during the process, but there uh, in the end, there were more groups of uh, 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 users who just erased these, who also told others where they are. And usually the, the trolls, after a while, they got bored. And it's not a really exciting um, uh, like outcome, but it is an outcome that reflects more or less all aspects of the community. And this is also, if you can really activate the different groups, you will be certain that the outcome is maybe a little bit boring. But in the end, it will not be the one extreme hand or the other extreme uh, that often dominates the media discourse, but it will be more a, a moderate and average and nuanced picture of uh, society. So we can really encourage uh, to do this and uh, also to watch this little video that you might find online to kind of get the, get the notion of how co-creation might work uh, uh, online, but also work with a lot of different uh, groups of uh, citizens. So that's my uh, yeah start and kickoff. I hope uh, you liked it. And if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to ask. Or if you go and stay in touch, there are some of the institutes and some of the projects I work with. Um, yeah. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, Anatol. That was really a great and insightful overview of concepts, key questions, and challenges to engage communities. Mm -hmm across Europe and it serves absolutely as a fundamental uh, entry point for our discussion of today. And now I would leave uh, the, the floor to the experience of a, of a city and in particular the city of Turin with their Urban Innovative Actions project uh, tonight. And uh, Alberto uh, Rudelat from uh, the Social Innovation, sorry, from the European Projects and Social Innovation Department of the city of Turin will introduce the, the project. So Alberto, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pietro, and good morning to everyone. I'm Alberto Rudelat from the Municipality of Turin. I'm the project assistant of the Tonight project, which is founded by uh, the Urban Innovative Action Program as well as uh, uh, the SPIRE project. So uh, I will give you um, a very brief uh, introduction to the project, and I want to share the, 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 the short experience we had so far in during the first year of the project uh, about co-creation and uh, engagement activities in times of social distancing. Um, first of all, I would like to start by saying that this presentation also includes and incorporates the work of the UIA experts, Valeria Ferraris, who uh, supports us during the tonight project and whose article will be published in the, coming soon, in the coming weeks. So I would like to thank her for her help uh, for this presentation. Um, uh, let me start with a very brief introduction to the tonight project. Uh, it's led by the Municipality of Turin and is founded by the UIA project, uh, program. It's a project on urban inclusion that uh, aims at uh, uh, improving the safety perception during the night time in specific areas of the city through uh, collaborative policies based on the social empowerment and the um, involving uh, residents, stakeholders, and uh, local communities. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, the project will develop uh, four main activities. 
first of all, uh, ethnographic and social research in the target neighborhoods in order to analyze the safety perception of the residents through uh, interviews, through uh, explorative walks, and through um, online surveys. Then uh, we carried out and we will carry out some engagement and empowerment activities uh, involving local communities, involving stakeholders, involving the third sector organizations, and um, some co-design activities for urban regeneration in the target areas, which means uh, uh, co-creation and co-design of physical intervention uh, in the public space, uh, uh, like street furniture and uh, public space regeneration in the target areas. And finally, we will give uh, technical and financial support to the local stakeholders, such as associations, uh, such as uh, uh, NGOs and third sector organizations, in order to uh, activate new local services, uh, which are able to generate social impact especially and in particular in the evening and in the night time. So the aim of the project is to approach the theme of the urban security in an inclusive way, let's say. And uh, um, as you can see, the project has a strong focus on participation, on civic engagement, on um, social inclusion. So of course, uh, the current pandemic situation represents a, a, a big challenge for us. Um, uh, yeah, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, in particular, as you may know, uh, between March and May, Italy was one of the countries that decided to close uh, almost all activities and uh, at least face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, let's say, human activities and to impose restrictions on movement. So uh, this means that we, uh, could no, no more organize uh, uh, social events, no more organize meetings and workshops and so on. But uh, nevertheless, a few days ago, so at the end of October, after the first year of the project, uh, we have almost completed the planned activities for the first year without delays. And of course, the question is, how can this be possible? I mean, uh, maybe we were just lucky. Uh, maybe it is, but actually I think that uh, um, there are two main factors that have allowed us to uh, meet the project deadlines. Next slide, please, Peter. Well, first of all, uh, I'll say the, the importance of the timing. Uh, I mean, the, the project starts uh, in September 2019 and with the, the initiation phase, and uh, the first activity, so the ethnographic research, uh, even if uh, the official launch of the, pro of the project happens in February 2020. So um, we start uh, really quickly. We start as soon as we can with the first activity. And uh, as you know, the initiation phase uh, uh, is a very interesting feature within the uh, Urban Innovative Action Program, because it allows project to be uh, in some way redefined and uh, allows us to um, avoid mistakes and to rewrite or at least redefine in, in, in some way the application form. But uh, what we have learned during this, uh, this period is that uh, if some activities are ready to be implemented, it is better to it is better to start. It is better to start as soon as it's possible, and also uh, taking some risks, but uh, starting really start to work as soon as it's possible. So we started immediately with the research activities, and uh, as a result, in March, when Italy, the whole country, went into lockdown the research was almost completed. Uh, I think we, we was missing just the last uh, uh, online survey in order to complete the task, but the task was almost completed. And uh, without that early start, the research would have needed to be really reviewed 
and this would create uh, a lot of problem for us, as you, can, as you can imagine. Also because the research was the first activity and we, uh, we want to use the, the, the research, the results of the research as a uh, data baseline in order to guide the future actions. So just imagine if we cannot have the, the research completed. So as a first lesson learned, I want to highlight the importance of uh, act in time, um, even in advance if it's, if it's possible, or at least uh, as soon as we can. So uh, even at the cost of taking some risk, because in the end, the program is called uh, Urban Innovative Action, is looking for innovative actions. And you know that uh, when you try to innovate, you have to take some risk. So this is the first lesson we have learned. Uh, the second one is the importance of redesign the uh, dialogue with the local community, redesign engagement and co-design activities. Uh, these kind of activities, of course, needed to be redesigned due to the restriction on movements and on uh, um, opportunities to meet. So uh, we have to... to we have to take care of this, we have to take it into consideration. And we decided to switch from uh, off offline activities to online activities. So basically to organize uh, online meetings. Uh, as you can see, nothing innovative in this case. I mean, that, that, that the solution may seem obvious, of course, and just switch from offline to online. But it's not so simple because uh, on the one hand, most of the people we met were not so used to have online meetings. Uh, like you've seen in the previous presentation, there are a lot of bias and a lot of disadvantaged group uh, for who is not so easy to switch from offline to online. On the other hand, it could not be taken for granted that these online meetings would be a success. Um, as a municipality, we invested a lot of time a lot of time in order to speak with the local actors, local stakeholders, local communities, sometimes one by one, other times in small groups or in larger scope. And the, the sentence you can see here in my presentation is a quote from my uh, project manager, Fabrizio Barbiero, who said, um, we discovered that we had more time during the lockdown and we decided to spend this time listening, which means uh, listening to, to the people, listening to the local communities, asking them to tell us uh, about their needs, their local needs, their ideas. Uh, sometimes the, the projects were already active in this area. So we basically spend two months, three months, involving people, listen to people, and trying to build a strong knowledge of the territory, strong knowledge of the uh, target areas. And well, um, just to give you an idea, from March to June, so in three or four months, we held about 15 online meetings uh, involving more than 70 people. 70 people coming from uh, um, local communities, coming from organization uh, which were working in, in the areas, um, institutions like museums, uh, primary or secondary schools, uh, um, church. Uh, I mean, we tried to find uh, local actors, uh, people who can help us to better understand the, the territory and to help us to, um, let's say, uh, organize future events or um, who want to be involved in the co-creation process, uh, in the uh, regeneration of uh, public spaces, and also uh, people who want to uh, candidate the ideas for the call for grant we are, uh, we are going to launch uh, at the end of the year in order to find uh, uh, social projects or projects with uh, social impacts uh, uh, during the night time. So, um, of course, uh, there was a great investment of time from our side as a municipality, but what we think is that uh, um, the time spent during the lockdown was really, really efficient, really effective, and honestly, 
we would not have obtained maybe the same results uh, in face-to-face -face meetings just because we don't have had the time to meet all these people. Um, we don't know why the meeting went well, because they actually went well from our point of view. And uh, um, I want to be very clear on this. Uh, this is not a celebration of distance call at all, because we all know that face-to-face -face interaction are much more uh, interesting, much more effective. And we all know that online platforms have limits, sometimes big limits, especially for some categories of people or category of communities. Uh, but what we have learned in our uh, short experience uh, during this, uh, this first year and during um, the, the, the pandemic crisis or during the lockdown in Italy is that also, um, let's say, uh, online or business interaction has some positive aspects. Uh, like, for example, uh, well, of course, punctuality, of course, <laughs> because no one comes late for, uh, for an online appointment, especially since we were stuck at home. So, uh, I mean, there was no excuse to, to, to be late. Or um, just think about the importance to go, let's say, uh, straight to the point without uh, uh, long introductions or long speeches. Um, one thing I've noticed is that uh, in this kind of meeting, you don't need to, uh, let's say, uh, to try to legitimate yourself as a participant or as a group, because you are actually already legitimated. I mean, you are here, you have been invited here from us as a local actor, as a local stakeholder, as a group, as a group that works on the field. So you are actually already legitimated. You don't need to uh, try to legitimate yourself. Um, I don't know, but maybe perhaps um, it, it's thanks to these aspects that the uh, online activities went uh, quite well, let's say, or maybe there was just, uh, um, I don't know, a great need to communicate in a period of lockdown and we were lucky to intercept in the right way this uh, need to communicate and need to participate in, a, in such a project like this. Um, obviously, um, as I said, not all problems have been solved and uh, uh, online meetings are not the solution of all problems because there are some meetings that are very difficult to organize online or even because the, even the best online platform cannot replace actually a face-to-face -face meeting, even in terms of participants. Just think about uh, uh, disadvantaged groups or um, I don't know, a digital divide in some case, or even just the, let's say the, the desire to participate online because we know that we asked the people uh, a really great effort because we asked people to join uh, online meeting uh, and to stay focused on the point for two hours, two hours and a half in front of a screen. So we know that we ask people a great effort and we don't know actually if we could ask the same effort in the future. We actually don't know at the moment. So what we, what we have learned, uh, what we think is that uh, given that this pandemic situation uh, for us, uh, at least as a municipality, it will be necessary to be really creative, really innovative and try to find new solution to overcome these problems and to try to engage people, even if uh, uh, we, we, we have to do it uh, um, online, uh, and not to and not in the field. Um, we we think and I think of course that occasion like this webinar could uh, help a lot because uh, Halo has to exchange uh, experiences and to exchange practices. Also because uh, um, this is very clear now we are uh, at the moment we are learning by doing in this situation. 
we are at, it's a totally brand new situation we we are we are learning we are doing and we are learning at the same time so it's very important to exchange experiences and best practice with our cities with our organization and to uh, collect different point of views so uh, thank you so much for inviting us and thank you all for your attention Alberto, thank you. Thank you very much. It has been really great to, to hear what a fellow, a sister city has been doing in, in involving the, the communities. Keywords like legitimation of the people, seizing and exploiting all the time that we have available and taking risks, being creative uh, and exploiting the need to communicate are, for, of course, key to, to the success of, uh, of your project. And we hope we can build on this and, and have success as well in our project. And now I'm very happy to give the floor to, to Maya Vipo from, from VAG, who will discuss and introduce several practices and methods for, for co-creation that has been readapted and reinvented during the, the pandemics and to face the, the social distancing requirements. So Maya, please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, so yes, it, uh, the slide says uh, adapting and reinventing co-creation, but maybe I'm going to do a plea for something slightly different, but uh, we will get to that when, uh, uh, when I go through my slides. Um, you can go to the next slide. I will give you a short introduction of, uh, of my background and uh, my organization's background. Um, so I work for WAG, uh, which is an, uh, um, sort of a, an institute um, for art, science and technology. Um, and it's been founded in 1994, uh, based on uh, um, our founder's uh, role as uh, being mayor of um, the digital city, uh, which was the first Dutch um, internet space. And so that's a really nice background to have uh, as an organization. We're located in the middle of Amsterdam, so we're very smack in the middle of pretty much every issue that is uh, happening in Amsterdam. Um, of course, right now, we're dealing it from it, with it from home, but um, uh, still very much involved with everything in Amsterdam. Um, and I'm leading the co-creation lab at WAG, and uh, WAG is a lot of content-based um, uh, labs, research-based uh, labs. Um, the co-creation lab is the only method methodology lab um, because it's uh, very much sort of the baseline of, what ev of everything that we're doing uh, at WAG. Um, and so we're making sure that we continue to sort of build upon the, the, the methodologies that we've been working with so far. Um, uh, you can go to the next slide. So uh, uh, what we're doing, and I think it's nice to have that contrast what we, with the earlier presentation of Anatol, um, is that uh, WAG operates in what we call a public research, which, is, which you can put next to um, uh, academic research and uh, market research. So we're sort of in the middle of those two uh, sections and we consider the society very much our research community. Um, so we're very much applied science uh, and public research in that sense, which also means that we're both trans transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary uh, in our work and work through all different sectors. And the main focus is then uh, societal impact, um, which means that we're doing our work in a different area. So that would include education, uh, heritage, for example, um, of course, government, one of the things that as well as uh, government issues, um, but also uh, sort of a slightly broader sense. Uh, so not just the relationship between citizens and uh, the government, but also stakeholders in a different sense. Uh, uh, for example, stakeholders in museums and, uh, uh, and in other creative agencies, for example. So what we're, we're dealing with is uh, a lot of these questions are um, about dealing with uncertainty. And I think co-creation is one of the uh, few methods that is actually very well equipped to deal with uncertainty. Um, and in that sense, you can say that having, uh, having the skills to do something like co-creation um, is actually something, uh, is a great skill to have in these times because uh, um, these are very uncertain times and we can sort of work towards that. You can go to the next slide. So with that in mind, um, I will, would like to present the sort of Baag's vision on, uh, on what co-creation is, and that's pretty much a sort of more holistic approach on um, 
of a, um, a principal way of working for social innovation in a broader sense. So it's not just um, co-creation in, in the most narrow sense uh, that we're saying we're, we're doing, we're working with communities, um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a more holistic approach. So I really liked uh, um, the notes from uh, the previous presenters as well, talking about mindsets, because that's something that is uh, very relevant in our context. Um, I will go through these uh, three steps or these three tripod uh, uh, legs um, and the, the, um, the metaphor of the tripod is also very relevant in this sense and saying that we, you need these three, each of these three legs to have a sort of a, a solid base for co-creation, um, but it also allows you to be flexible and look in different directions, um, having that uh, uh, sort of that base. Um, so yeah, let's uh, go to the first to the next slide. So if we're looking at a co-creation process, um, I think there's a lot of exper experts in the um, in this meeting. I'm also curious what the rest of the group, of course, is contained of. But uh, um, to us, co-creation is a lot more than just working with uh, citizens in the context of uh, the government. Um, or with stakeholders in another sense, it's a, it's a more holistic and longer approach. Um, and that means that you also have to look at your own sort of position as you, when you start a co-creation process. And so we, uh, we added sort of three sort of entry points before you actually start doing the actual co-creation to make sure that you are very much prepared. So a few things I see, there's a lot of conversations already in the chat and I see uh, that one of these words that's been used a lot here is, uh, is the word trust. Um, and that's a very relevant issue in the, when we're talking about co-creation um, is that if you want to set up a co-creation process, um, if you don't have the trust of the people that you want to involve, then you're sort of um, done from the start. So investing in good relationships is, a, is part of your foundational uh, issues. But that means also very much self-reflection, knowing where you, what your relationship is towards the other uh, and towards the people that you start to work with. But also, um, if we're talking about context, it's about uh, um, uh, really understanding who are you dealing with. Uh, so we have a word for it, it's called sensitizing, so that you have as, actually it's something that Anatole did in, in the beginning with them, with the mind game, is sort of sensitizing towards you, yourself, towards the sort of the opinion and the vision of someone, someone else, so that you are sort of open to, uh, to their vision. And of course, you have to build your community. And those three things ha you have to do before you actually can do something of a co-creative uh, um, activity. Um, and these things are continue to sort of evolve. So um, it's also an iterative approach in, in that sense. Um, and of course, a wrap up is also a very clear sort of demarcated um, set of your uh, process. So uh, um, all the, not co-creation is not just an intervention, it is a, it's a, it's a way of living. And you can even say that um, co being able to um, facilitate co-creation could be considered a, a trade or a, or a craft um, in that you need to have you, you can have a whole set of uh, you have a nice toolbox, but if you don't know when and where to use your, your tools, then if you were a, a, a furniture maker, then you still wouldn't know how to make a chair, for example. So it is important to know when and where you need to use each of these methods. Um, and also considering being in a trademan, um, you have your own style and you have your own ways of working. So not every method would work for the same person. So you can go to the next slide. Um, if we're talking about um, one of the other legs other than knowing and, and understanding what is needed for a process, um, is that actually you need to have a certain mindset to, uh, to facilitate a, a co-creative process. Um, these are the seven mindsets that Waag has sort of defined over the years. Um, and of course, there's some overlap in it and you can use different words for it. But uh, um, we've, we found that being aware of these type of mindsets um, in a co-creative process can be very helpful in sort of facilitating something. Um, and especially if we're looking at, a, at times of uncertainty, um, it can be very, very nice to fall back on sort of a, a set uh, mindsets. Um, 
that you can use. So if we're talking about, for example, being flexible is a, is a very good uh, uh, sort of attitude to have uh, when you step into a co-creative process. Being sensitive is that also, um, and one of the things that I very much uh, enjoy in, uh, in a co-creative process is being optimistic and sort of being um, willing to see that there are possibilities and options. And, and I think, especially when we're talking about now co-creation in these times, being optimistic is a, is a very helpful sort of um, activation of your own uh, position, especially since if you're at home and you don't see where, you, where you're going, it might be a, a good way to sort of maybe even force yourself to, to look in, to, to adopt this type of mindset. So we use these type of mindsets to in uh, in our processes uh, along the way. Um, I have a lot more uh, uh, information about that if you want that. Um, and then you can go to the next slide. And then the third uh, leg of it is, of course, still having those methods and tools at your disposal and knowing um, when to use what. Um, in in order to uh, facilitate that, we Bach has has opened up the co-creation navigator. Uh, I think about two years ago. It's an open source, uh, an open platform where we uh, document all the tools and methods that uh, we think are relevant and useful. And they are also uh, placed in a way similar to uh, a description of the process. So you will also see which tools would work in uh, which situation. Um, yeah, you can go to the next slide. All right, so if we're talking about these uh, co-creation in, in times of social distancing, then of course, there's a lot of things that we can't do. And I think we should acknowledge that um, even though um, there are still things, a lot of things, if we're an optimistic mindset, there are still a lot of things that we can do. But I think the ad most sort of important uh, added value of doing co-creation with people in the same room and the same space is that it will sort of generate what we call latent knowledge, um, knowledge that wasn't necessarily there or the, you didn't know that was there, but it would emerge when people interact with each other and that sort of brings new insights. Um, and that's also when new different opinions come together and then uh, that will work sort of have a different energy. You can try to recreate that online or in the smaller groups, but that is also always diff more difficult to, uh, to generate that. So if we're looking at this model, this is the, one of the models created by Slaystoke Fischer, who would have done a lot of research into co-creation. You can see that there's the, the more more use you make of what we call generative techniques, so which would be some forms of co-creation and more uh, maker activities, for example, uh, more playful activities. Um, you get to, to a deeper level of where people are and what they feel and what they want to share so that you also have a better understanding of how they would operate in, uh, in the questions that you ask them. You can go to the next slide. Um, so then um, one of the things is we're, we're dealing with humans and, uh, and humans uh, have a, we are now in the times of change, especially in your, when you're evolving people in your, in your processes, you still want to sort of generate some form of change um, and you need to have knowledge to do that. Um, and I think uh, uh, Dan Ariely is a very good uh, um, researcher in uh, human behavior. Um, and this is, a, I think, a, a, quite an important quote in, in that we are, can only, only operate in the sort of the environment that we are in at that moment. And it's uh, sometimes uh, difficult to see beyond that. And it will also determine the choices that you make and that you, the decisions that you make. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Um, am I missing one? That's not, I thought I missed one. No, it's okay. Um, so that means that, that there's a lot of things that we need to recalibrate if we're looking at uh, um, uh, co-creation. So it's not just um, that we now have to switch platforms or we have to switch um, to different circumstances, but they're also, so, but also the things that our people are concerned with are now different. And so some of the things that we took for granted or that were given at the beginning of a project because society happened to be in a certain way 
um, society is is in itself totally different right now, and it's also different in different cities and different places. Um, so, of course, trust the one that was mentioned in the chat for a lot of points. Um, the the matter of trust is uh, something that you need to recalibrate in the beginning of a co-creation process or during a new project. Um, but also the, the facts of the factor of priority. Um, people might have a totally different focus at this point in time um, than when you started a project or when you thought you would start, start a project. Um, so really investing in that context phase where what I showed earlier um, and really start to understand people better is something that sort of you need to go back on when we're talking about so working in social distancing times, um, which also means that when we're talking about accessibility, um, not everybody has access to internet or has interest in working on internet. Um, but that means that if you want to involve certain people, you don't need to be uh, saying, oh, well, we only want to involve the people that can reach us. Uh, you should flip it around and you should also always go towards the people that you would like to reach. Um, so there are different elements here. Um, with looking at the time, I think we should go to the next slide, but um, we can go into more detail in, in the discussion. Um, so if we're talking about sort of the idea of we can only operate and know where the, in, um, in the environment that we are in, um, the, the assignment here is that you create what we call an enabling environment. So that this is sort of the optimal circumstances for acting and participating and changing. Um, and that doesn't mean, and that's different for every person, and it's also different for every group. So it's always depending on the on the questions and the, and the um, um, conversations that you want to have. So some things, sometimes the, uh, a Zoom call is the optimal circumstance for people to act, but in some cases it isn't. So maybe you sh you should do small visits, or you should go to uh, different places. So you can go to the diff next slide, uh, Pietro. Um, so it could mean um, that you have to go bigger. So for example, on the left side, this is a hackathon that Bach uh, created with 140 participants, um, all work working long distance, um, but uh, with, a, with a, a big studio set up where everything was served, sort of centrally organized. So that's sort of something that sort of a lot bigger than was originally planned. Um, on the other end, something you can also go when the weather allows it, you can go outside. Some, some of these regulations are still allowing that. Um, so it, you always have to move with the situation that you're in and also the people that you would like to reach. Um, so if we're going then to the, um, I think the core of the issue here is that we're dealing with humans um, and humans, especially in this situation that we're in, people are more and more isolated. So don't, it's sort of two sides of the same coin is that on the one hand, we have the issue of social distancing, but that also means more isolation. Um, and if we're talking about sort of how we're, we're dealing already with people only in their own bubbles um, and they, that there's a risk of people sort of continuing their uh, sort of their stance in their own bubble. So one of the, I think, priorities in, these, in, in this time is actually investing in human interaction and social connection. Um, so that means that in, when we're talking about co-creation, I think a more, a dis, a proportionally, a more amount of time should actually be invested in social interaction, social uh, activities rather than going directly for content because people really need an outlet for so socialization and social uh, interaction and also learning from each other. So if you're looking at sort of the next slides, there are a few activities that we've been working with um, um, at WAG um, and I'm happy to share them with you as well. And so it actually, um, Pietro has experienced a few of these already in, uh, in the Centrino project. Um, but these are sort of small warm up activities in, in these are online warm up activities that you can do um, to make to for one help people collaborate um, for people to get to know each other and sort of focus on sort of the human level other than um, you have a different opinion than me. So we're all humans there and we have a sort of a different perspective, but um, 
um, we're still trying to work together. So these are a few of the, the issues that I, I, can, I can explain them in more detail, but I think for, if for the sake of this uh, uh, webinar, we can go uh, through it a little bit faster um, and I can actually uh, give you the, the resource. So you can go to the next one. So right now on the co-creation navigator, we actually added um, a filter, um, which is on the bottom. Um, where you can select whether a tool is, if you can use a tool that is in the navigator that could be used online or offline or both. Um, so that makes it also easier for you to sort of select the tools that might be uh, relevant to you. Um, so I would uh, invite everybody to, uh, to have a look at the navigator and see if there are things that can work out. So the ones that I just showed you are also in the navigator. So yeah, you can go through the recap. Um, so if we're looking at uh, um, sort of readjusting and uh, um, uh, times of co-creation, I would actually say it's more of a plea for professionalization uh, in co-creation and that we're sort of looking at the more holistic approach of co-creation if we're looking at the sort of the steps of understanding the process, having the certain mindset um, to deal with it and then also have a quite a, a big repository of method at your, methods at your disposal, um, which makes it, if you have those sort of strong bases, it makes it a lot easier to adapt to new circumstances. Um, and at the same time, you need to accept that there are now limitations and these are also temporary lim limitations. Um, you should recalibrate and work towards enabling environments. And uh, don't forget that we're dealing with humans and. Uh, even though there's a screen in between you, um, you're still, uh, you have human connection. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's it for me. Um, there are a few, re so like I said, the navigator, the ccn.vagjok.org is the co-creation navigator. Um, I also wrote a small, uh, very practical article about these warm-up activities, um, which I wrote at the beginning of uh, lockdown. Um, and uh, it created a lot of fun at our, our organization to do those. So uh, I would uh, invite you to check that out as well. Great. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you very much for showing this three as key aspects, process, mindset, and methods within the co-creation, within co-creation, the need for recalibration, but especially for, for developing enabling environments, which I think is gonna be a key also for our project. Uh, and for involving the, the communities we are trying to reach. So now I'm very happy to leave the floor to Elena Toscano from Urbach and uh, Kallipolis, and she will uh, discuss <clears throat> about experimenting online participation to support local communities across Europe, starting from the experience of Urbach and uh, Kallipolis as well. So Elena, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, Pietro. And a good afternoon to everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here today because uh, I have had the opportunity to listen to very interesting presentation first. And then I will have the opportunity to talk about one of my main passion, which is uh, to build up participation, to build participatory processes. So uh, today I would like to share with you some of the, I would like to, to, to call them experiments we started to, um, uh, to build up for maintaining the interactivities across the urban communities in Europe, especially focus on the uh, Urbac program. And I can really ask you, Pietro, to go to the next slide, please. Because uh, all of us know that uh, the 2020 year has had a dif different plans for all of us. And the global pandemic forced us to rethink the way we have a proceeding with the participation. So the question uh, among uh, other, um, other experts working with the participation, with the, uh, engaging processes was about how to keep alive the interactivity and the co-design processes, especially focus on the urban environments during the lockdown, but also later, which will be uh, the possibility to build a concrete participation also respecting the social distance. So please go to the next slide. And for uh, that reason, uh, as a message of solidarity, 
uh, for the urban communities in the spring of 2020, in the early beginning of the lockdown period, with other two colleagues from the Urbact program, which is a program about the integrated urban development um, funded several cities across Europe with the two colleagues, uh, uh, Sandra Rainero and Eddie Adams, we started to think, to try to give an answer, to give a, a concrete response to, the, to uh, the network funded by the program, but also to the cities and of course, to the local communities. Please consider that Urbact has funded almost 50 networks of cities and each network is composed by a, 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 an average of seven cities. So a lot of cities and behind the cities, a lot of citizens and a lot of community. So we, we started uh, to create this uh, suite of products to let uh, the people, to let the cities to continue to co-create to work together with their local community, but also to work in the transnational dimension together. Please, next. And for that reason, uh, we uh, co brought uh, together this it's, it's so called incentives for online facilitation. Because uh, the idea was to focus, of course, on the uh, on the Urbact community with the idea to, to, uh, to give some practical advice, to give some practical information for, for citizens, for communities, but also uh, thinking about how to um, recreate the process, the participatory process when we have to move online and we couldn't count on the physical dimension of the urban space. So uh, this guide is mainly focused, is mainly addressed to, to the Urbact community, as I said, that means to the local coordinator, to the local facilitators, but it's also uh, addressed to the uh, facilitators who work in the, um, for creating a better environment by engaging the local stakeholders. So it's for all practitioners. Following, please. But when we started to uh, think about uh, how we have to build this guide, how, how we have to build this uh, suite of products for letting uh, the work on for our, uh, for our um, audience, we started to think that what happens was that uh, uh, the global pandemic accelerated the digital revolution of participatory processes. Because I think that uh, all, uh, all of us, uh, know that also in building participatory process we need to use the digital dimension and all of us would, would like to try the digital dimension also maybe forced the global pandemic but this period accelerated the many processes and uh, for the participatory processes it was a kind of experimental period to, to try to use the blended approach so we decided to build the guide, thinking also uh, in, the, in the future, thinking also the, after the pandemic period, trying to combine the virtual dimension with the physical dimension we really need so much. Why to keep the virtual dimension also after the pandemic? Because in the virtual dimension, there are also some benefits. I think that... Um, uh, most of us are thinking about the ecological footprint, which is true, but also there is the aspect of the equal opportunity for women first, for young careers, uh, most often mothers, but also for people with disabilities, because they struggle to attend, for example, transnational meetings and struggle to attend long travels to join us, to join, sorry, uh, partners or to join some transnational meetings. So next. But in the document, in the guide, there are two main chapters. The first one is the focus on the role of the facilitator, because it's true that you have to plan very well a participatory process. And I agree completely with the, with the Maya Vipo, because I think it's, it's very important that you have to control 
your process, you have to control the methodology you would like to use. But I believe also uh, in the role of the facilitator because it's the key person in charge to drive your process, in charge to uh, facilitate, moderate the discussion, and also keep the democracy. And uh, he or she has an important role for uh, building very well a participatory process. So we focus in on the facilitator, but we also uh, saw that the role of the facilitator remain the same for some aspect, but of course uh, you need to um, increase some competencies or maybe you have to put in place different skills if you want to have the same or a successful meeting even if online. For that reason we try to organize uh, 10 tips, next slide please, to uh, support uh, especially local facilitators, but also uh, transnational facilitators uh, in charge to, uh, to run a transnational, uh, the transnational dimension of uh, uh, European projects in order to give some practical advice on how to organize online interactive meetings. And if we have time, I would like to show you, okay, a short uh, uh, slide deck where you could find these 10 top tips for organizing a good online meeting. Please consider that uh, when we created that tool, we were in the, early uh, in the early beginning of this online crazy period. So it was uh, to, to give the first idea on how to create online meetings, please. There is no audio, I think, Pietro. I think maybe you should unmute yourself, uh, Pietro. I think it should work now. Thank you. So I will give you back the, the presentation. There we go. Thank you very much. So 
I think it's not in the presentation style, but it's it's the is same. It, is it not? Or, okay. It's not a full screen. Mm, okay, so the good. after the, the chapter on the role of the facilitator, we focus on methods and the techniques for the virtual facilitation. We, we did a practical overview on participative methods, which were transposed in the virtual setting. So we're trying to define a typical urbac dimension that means to, to work together uh, among uh, cities, but also to work in the local dimension with your relevant stakeholders with the aim to create a local action plan or with the aim to implement some innovative actions. For that reason, in the guide, you could find some practical uh, methodologies, some practical techniques for uh, providing ice breaking, for providing some energizing um, exercise for the stakeholder analysis, for the idea generation, for voting and building the consensus, for the action planning, and for presenting and sharing in virtual settings. Next, please. And in the network I have been working for as a lead expert, we try to experiment some of those methodologies in the transnational dimension of the network, which is composed by eight cities, but also in the local dimension. Consider that the network so-called the playful paradigm is focused on the philosophy of play. And the lead partner, the city of Udine in Italy, as uh, um, committed in transferring the good practice of uh, um, dealing with the play philosophy to other seven European cities. Next, please. So the, the, the aspect of the citizen participation is crucial in playful paradigm because uh, promoting the play, uh, the playful philosophy means to, um, to try to boost the, the citizen participation, to try to uh, better include your local stakeholders, but also to provide some a better sustainability and healthy lifestyle across cities because partners are also uh, keen in experimenting the power of play to redesign the cities, to claim streets open to play, to educate children and adults about sustainability and all of that about the, uh, all of that using the play approach, the playful approach. Next, please. So we really need to uh, refigure uh, how to work uh, both at the transnational level, but especially at the local level, because when the pandemic started, the playful paradigm uh, was uh, more or less in the in the half of the uh, lifespan of the project. So, what we did was to uh, we, we provided first of all a training, a training for the local uh, facilitators, a training for the local coordinators. We created a network of the local facilitators because in Urbac, in the Urbac program, each city um, which is part of the project as a, a local support group, a kind of forum. We also could call as in the agenda 24th, a kind of forum, a kind of, uh, um, a kind of local group to support the city to or better organize the activity to implement the project. So we created a network of local uh, support group coordinators of local facilitators, and we tried to, um, to share with them and to create with them how we could uh, continue to work at local level, but also uh, in the transnational dimension. And what was very interesting was that um, behind the, the, the lifespan of the project and the, the commitment we had to, to follow the project activities, cities decided to support each other in creating an, an innovative and also an unexpected tool so-called playful at home. That means that each city created a kind of toolbox 
a toolbox of play for their citizens, for their local communities, using the eight local languages of, uh, of the cities, of the countries joining the, pro the project. Uh, the next, please. So here we can see some of the examples. For example, Larissa and Greece created a website to deliver some entertainment, but also helpful information for citizens. In Viana do Castello in Portugal, they built up a theater at home for their citizens. And in Esplugas de Llobregat in Spain, they design a week of play uh, online for engaging with local stakeholders and local communities. Next, please. But also uh, one of the city, which is Cork in Ireland, realized that for their, um, for their community to work just online was not enough, also during the lockdown period. And they created a toolbox, a physical toolbox of play to uh, be delivered in the deprived neighborhoods, in the suburbs of Cork they enrolled some play leaders, so they identify some, some people uh, in charge to, to deliver, uh, physical deliver this uh, play box to the families in need. And that was very, very uh, nice approach and nice project and uh, express the philosophy of the blended approach. Next, please. But as I said, we also use the online dimension also for the transnational meetings and also for the capitalization event we created for the European Week of Region and Cities held on 8 October 2020. The Playful Paradigm was one of the partners of this event and uh, we were committed in uh, uh, creating a play a laboratory with the aim to launch the idea of the European capital of play. But of course, the event was delivered completely online. And we did a big effort in trying to build up an interactive meeting by using the play philosophy, the play approach. Next, please. We uh, design a play participatory online laboratory by using a, a storytelling game for inviting the people to contribute to the charter to, uh, to be built for launching the idea of the European capital of play. And um, alive also we engage some visual facilitator who were in charge to, uh, to provide a graphic harvest of the meeting. So we combine some methodologies of the participation, but also some gamification methodology. And I think that uh, we, uh, we could say that the meeting was successful, even if it was a little bit complicated to organize, but it was well organized. But what, what I would like to say is that many people were in the background, were in the backstage, sorry, because we need to have two partner testimonial, one facilitator, three co-facilitator, one play passionate, three graphic designers, and one guest testimonial, one guest star for, uh, for making the wrap up. Next, please. And in the end, we achieved to have this vision of the playful city shared among 60 participants of the meeting, in the meeting. Next. And uh, um, this is last uh, two last slides where I, I, I wish to, to share with you some ideas built with my organizations called Callipolis. Because uh, with Callipolis, uh, uh, we, um, we have been working for a long time by using the participatory approach for building a sustainable urban projects. And uh, we have this project so-called URA, which is in Turin. And the aim of the project is to um, provide some activities for the urban regeneration of some deprived neighborhood of Turin in Italy. And one of the idea was to engage some artists to uh, co-create and to co-design with them some artistic intervention for the neighborhoods. 
And what we did was to, um, to try to, to build a storytelling of the neighborhoods by a one-to-one -one meeting, respecting the social distance, of course. And the next slide, please. And later, these collective stories were transposed in a performance, in a music performance for the neighborhood. Next, please. And it was very interesting also to try to experiment this uh, artistic participative methodology because uh, uh, gave us the, the opportunity to experiment also ER the blended formula because the concept was uh, um, a show also online in, uh, in Facebook and we could also organize in presence for the neighborhood. So in conclusion, if uh, I had to try to write a recipe of the blended formula or for a new generation of uh, uh, participatory processes, I think that it's important to try to uh, be creative, but also to plan very well the activities and of course uh, to experiment platform and tools, but not, don't forget that the, the facilitation, the role of the facilitator is most important of all the online platforms you could use for providing an online meeting. So I think that uh, we have to keep uh, simple if possible and also enjoy as forced if we want that our interactive meeting will be enjoyable also for our participants. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Ileana. It was really interesting and uh, insightful uh, presentation looking at several experiences and several interesting approaches. And if I have to recap and a bit wrap up what we said, I've, I've noted down some, some keywords just to fit in the, the discussion and then I would leave the, the floor to, to our discussions. But I would say that trust is a key word, taking, being able to take risks, to be creative and to, to recalibrate our activities and our habits towards to the new situation. Enabling environments is of course a key point, being human centered and trying to uh, allow equal opportunities, which is uh, a feature that actually uh, digital tools allow, breaking out all, uh, all possible barriers. Uh, it's of course crucial the role of the facilitator as well as a well uh, thought agenda and plan, and as well as to keep the, the audiences always entertained, keep the tension high, stimulate them, and also give some physical tools to let the people be active physically instead of uh, during the, the digital meeting. Uh, that said, I think this keywords could be very useful to fit in the, the debate. And I would like to, to give the floor to, to my colleague, Kodrut Pavina from uh, Urba Sofia for his first reactions and then round of questions to, the, to our panel of uh, speakers. And then I would also ask any, if there are any questions, so please raise your hands on the on, on, on Zoom using the, the raise hand tool or raise your, your question in the, in the chat box. Please, if you're raising the question in the chat box, be brief, otherwise I will not have the time to, to read the whole, the whole thing. So, Kodrut, please, floor is yours. Hi. Uh, thank you, all panelists, for a very inspiring presentation. Uh, I want to highlight the fact that uh, what Pietro said, uh, trust is the key word in uh, co-creation. And human connection and social activities are very important. As a question for all panelists, uh, I think building trust between public administration and citizens is a very gradual process. Do you think that uh, in the whole digital environment, this is more difficult or is the digital environment uh, an opportunity for a more involved community? Hello, everyone. Um, I don't know what the uh, status and how should we proceed. Uh, I'm Bianca Muntean. Uh, from Transylvania IT. Uh, do you see us as interfering or are you having? I, I, I hear you a bit, I hear a bit robotic, but I would suggest that uh, Kodrut makes the first round of, quiz, of, uh, of questions. We have a round of answers from our speakers and then I will leave the floor to, to other partners for uh, asking further questions. Okay, because I was looking at the time and I didn't know exactly in what phase were we. Thank you very much for clarification. Have you heard me before when I was talking? 
Yes. yes. So I would start from uh, any of the, uh, the panelists who wants to start first, please. Ileana. Yeah, I don't know if I have the answer to this question, but I think that the, the blended formula, so to use the digital dimension and the physical one could, could help the process to, to engage all, uh, all stakeholders, all citizens. I don't know if all, but of course more, uh, more stakeholders. So um, I think, yes, could be an opportunity for us all to, to learn also from these digital tools in order to try to engage the, uh, the target group we generally couldn't include in our participatory processes. Because for example, the participatory processes for the urban planning uh, generally are, are built in the evening. And for example, uh, that could create some problem for mothers or for fathers who has to manage also the family needs, for example. So I think to, to try to combine both uh, aspects, the digital one and the physical could be an opportunity, yes. Maya, you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think uh, Eliana is, is, it says a lot that I would say as well, but um, <clears throat> I think it's also very much dependent on where, in what stage of connection you are. So if it's, um, in the early stages, if you have to really start up a community, then it might be diff more difficult, or at least you get a. Um, if you only, for example, do your communication on online, then you're definitely going to miss a large group of people that you would like to involve. Um, whereas in maybe previous times, you would go into the neighborhood and go um, look for people. Um, and at the same time, I think in this case also mm -hmm. to the point of that which I made earlier is that um, I think the priorities for people also shift. So if people, some people, like Elena said, that feel now that they, for one, have time to do something or that they are interested in the subject all of a sudden, and, but the other way around is also very relevant. So would, if you were, for example, very much involved in parking spaces in your local community for example and right now you don't need to take your car then that's all of a sudden no longer a relevant issue for example so those type of issues also have taken to um, come into play when you are readdressing people so if it's a running project then it's often easy to switch to online situations and keep the trust going but if it's new then you really have to reassess what you would like to sort of achieve in that sense. Right. And I also, also have like a question for, for Alberto because uh, I know you had like, you've been really able to use, use very well the time you did the research before the lockdown and then during the lockdown, you've been able to eventually interact with the, with the community and the people. But I, I, have, a, I have a question on how you were actually able to engage and activate those citizens during the lockdown since you were not, I mean, I have, maybe I didn't understand it, but you were not working with them before. So like, how did you get to them while being home? Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, well, actually we was already working uh, in these neighborhoods. Uh, we as a municipality and the two key partners were um, yeah, uh, were working yet on the on these kind of neighborhoods. Uh, so we 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 had two key partners uh, um, which were working on engagement uh, uh, month before the project starts, and that's why we choose uh, uh, these two specific neighborhoods because we would like to start from a community that already, um, let's say, already existed. So we try to. Um, uh, well, let's say speed up and uh, and to increase the participation uh, of local communities, but this specific neighborhood was already active, already active in, in processes, in uh, already active in um, working on the local field. So during the lockdown, uh, during the first month, um, of course, we we were still able to to have offline meetings. 
So we had a lot of meetings, a lot of interviews, a lot of uh, events to engage people. And then when, uh, um, when the lockdown came, of course, we switched to online. And uh, of course, we lost some participants because as Maya and Ileana said, uh, I mean, it's not so simple to switch from uh, offline to online. But at least we had already engaged the people in the stage before, and we tried to transfer them to online methodologies. Uh, we also have two technical partners that work as uh, facilitators. Um, so uh, they had a lot of methodologies online and offline. So they help us, of course, to engage people uh, to. Um, transfer them to from on off on, offline to online. Great, great, thank you. Um, yep, and there is a question I've heard in the, in the chat book. There is a bit of um, of discussion, and it's, it's a quick, practical, pragmatic question. But a few people uh, were discussing about what tools would be recommended to to use for, to facilitate co-creation meetings, uh, etc. So, if you just have very quick, uh, of course, I would say the the VAG tools will be <laughs> recommended, Playful Paradigm uh, and hints and tips, of course, as well. So, but please, uh, if you have like some, some hints, uh, please. I saw there was a question about um, uh, whiteboard, online whiteboards. Right. Um, so the Miro or Mural. I think this is also something that is uh, very much dependent on the technical skills of your participants. Um, and there's different ways, of course, you can use it. But for example, if you're in a Zoom meeting, then you already have one screen filled, right? So if you also want people to participate in a Miro board or, or a Miro board, then you have need to have at least two screens up and running. So that, that alone is sort of a technical re request um, that you should ask in that sense. A re a, an alternative there is, of course, that you have a note taker that shares their screen um in a mirror board and that people can still afterwards look into it so those are there are there are options to sort of mitigate that um but it is still um an extra hurdle often for people to to do that in that way um there are also sort of um um sort of uh, less digital forms of it that you have a note taker that actually physically takes note and takes part as a an extra Zoom participant that also, so that you can see someone writing, for example. So that's also an option. Um, but of course, the Miro boards are also always online. So that's nice so they can see also afterwards that something is happening there as well. Um, so I don't have a necessarily a strong opinion on whether or not you should use it. I think this is typically a case of what works for you as a facilitator. Um, and then um, because that's, Pretty much your the style that that determines how you would approach this so if it's if it's an obstacle for you as a facilitator then don't use it but if it's if you feel that it's helpful for you to document something while you're working for example um i think it, it could be very useful I've, I've seen it used in several um uh, conferences as well in breakout rooms for example for um uh, breakout sessions in conferences and there's always different ways of working with it but uh it can be very useful to have that online. Right. Of course, there's a, also an, um, a privacy issue there, having uh, your thoughts and things online. Somehow some people have, have uh, problems with having, even though they're sort of sharing them with others, but uh, it's also uh, uh, something that you need to take into account whether or not people are sort of feel free and safe enough. I think safety is a very big thing in these things as well people feel safe enough to share their thoughts, put them in paper, on, on, in writing and have them somewhere on the web. And it's still too abstract sometimes for people. I would have one more question to, to Ileana before uh, leaving the floor to uh, Bianca Montan from Alice Transylvania. But my first question to, to Ileana, you were mentioning this very interesting thing of giving physical tools for digital events. So. Now, of course, like there could be things that you do physically with simply plain uh, paper and, and pen, but if you need to have some more elaborated uh, forms, tools, uh, or like say things, devices, uh, of course, delivered to the community you're interacting with 
how do you manage to reach these people? Do you ship the, the materials, the questionnaires beforehand? Uh, do you gather them in a place? Or do you, what, what do you do to get them <clears throat> the physical things you've developed and thought of? Yeah, if I have understood well, I think that you mean the experience of Cork. Right. where uh, yes where they designed to create this box this physical box to be delivered for the people the families in need during the lockdown so of course the delivery uh, was done uh, you respecting the safety the safety sorry rules uh, respecting the distance and everything but of course if you plan to combine the digital dimension with some physical activities you have to plan uh, both uh, in the same time so you have to to have a, a calendar of your activities you have to enroll someone and uh, in the case of cork for example they um, enrolled some uh, so-called play leaders i don't remember if uh, also maya or uh, uh, the previous in the previous presentation was uh, told that it's very important to um, to enroll the right people if you want to boost your participatory intervention and in the case of cork in ireland they before the pandemic crisis uh, enrolled some play leaders that means some people from their local community interested in using play as a tool for inclusion as a tool for sustainability and they um, work together with these uh, play leaders training training them and also later to um, uh, to creating a kind of networking and local networking for delivering some physical material for their community. But of course, when you have to conceive a blended formula, you could use several tools. And also in the, in the physical meeting, if you want, for example, to uh, provide some exercises, some energizing exercise or some moments of break, you could use some objects. You could use some, um, I don't know, dance, for example. In one of our meetings, we tried to, to dance for five minutes during the online meeting. So all of this physical activity, of course, help you in relax your mind and keep back your concentration. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. So uh, I see in the, in the chat box that there is um, Rui Franco from uh, the municipality of, of Lisbon. And of course, they have a lot of, uh, been doing a lot of work with the CLD and citizens participation. And I am pretty sure they, they did a lot of work to reframe their activities and their approach also during the, the lockdown. So I would be very happy to hear what Rui has to, to say, what to, he did in, uh, in Lisbon. So Rui, please, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for the couple of seconds. I'll try to be as brief as possible. Just saying that the, uh, Lisbon is running an urban CLD for, for five years. This is an European prog program where a wide local partnership decides and manages European funding to, be, to support local initiatives. And we were finally able to negotiate uh, a call to, to, to launch a call of about 5 million uh, euros on mainly ESF. And, uh, and this happened in, in March and then everything became well, closed as, as everybody knows. So what we've combined and I wanted, I, I think it, it could be useful to share this. So the, the whole plan is how to divide 5 million euros in the most effective way in the, very mo in the most de 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 deprived neighborhoods of Lisbon uh, on a bottom up uh, uh, initiatives that tackle their own challenges which are now highly aggravated. And so together with all these traditional uh, uh, online conferences and presentations and toolkits and uh, templates for applications and projects and examples, what we've defined as a way to have direct citizen engagement was that on top of all this online system, we launch uh, a traditional post uh, system to all one, 150,000 mailboxes of these neighborhoods where then people voted on which projects to get funded by a simple tradition, traditional uh, text message. Uh, and just to reinforce what, what, what other people were saying is that 
uh, not the same the same system, the same technology doesn't approach, doesn't engage everyone. And uh, I think that the tool of our success is to to blend, to mix different approaches, so that people with different kinds of access and knowledge can participate in a big scale of. Uh, and so, in the end, we ended up to reinforce the this participatory uh, community-led local development system to decide and to uh, uh, grant with five million, which has just happened. It's the, the competition is now closed and evaluation is closed with having a huge uh, a part of the decision made on popular vote during lockdown and this worked thank you great yeah yeah this this is very very crucial to having different technologies and, and approaches for different people is absolutely key to reach and, uh, and have success in, uh, in the participation so now i since we have the last nine minutes in our webinar uh, I would ask if there are any partners from the, the Spire Consortium that want to ask uh, any further questions, or if our UIA expert uh, Amaya wants to ask um, a question. Uh, I don't see anything. Uh, Kodrus, do you want to ask a final question? No, I'm fine. All right, so I'm coming to, to an end of this very intense, intense and interesting and insightful and really was really very very interesting uh, sharing and learning moment uh, and hardly happened that uh, I've been in a, in a webinar where we learned so much from so many different experiences so I really want to warmly thank all of our speakers starting from Ilana Toscano, uh, Alberto Rudellat, Meia Vepo and Anatol Iten as well uh, as well as our discussants Kodrus uh, Papina first of all, um, Rui Franco also for chipping in and um, raising his uh, and sharing his experience from from Lisbon so I would just share my screen for one last time uh, because I want to also warmly thank you for being with us today but also we are looking forward to seeing you at our next events uh, this is a series of thematic webinars geared to present the different aspects and topics of, of our UAE project Spire and so the next one will be um, thematic will be on building new digital digital economy, the blockchain for future climate natural cities on the 17th of November. On the 24th of November, we will discuss circular ecosystems for sustainable and energy efficient cities, new frontiers for biomass upcycling. And finally, on the 8th of December, we will discuss about the reclaiming polluted brownfields through fit remediation. So uh, without any further to do, I would really thank you very much all for, for being here and I'm looking forward to see you the next time. Thank you.